right, good morning. Happy Father's Day to all you dads out there. Those of you who are here in person, did you get your bacon on the way in? How awesome is that? You show up to church and you're given bacon on your way in. Doesn't get much cooler than that. For those of you watching at home, uh, we were serving bacon to dads as they came into church today. Now, as we get started, all of us have had to deal with difficult people, right? We've all had to deal with difficult people at one point or another in our lives. As we're in Father's Day today, and when I think of difficult people, I think of my dad. Not because my dad is difficult, but because my dad had to deal with difficult people his entire career. My dad was a corrections counselor for the state of New York. That means that he guided and advised and worked with convicted criminals in the prison system on a daily basis for over 20 years. And so he dealt with difficult people every day. And I remember specifically as a young man having to go into a challenging conversation with difficult people and asking my dad for advice one day. And I said, Dad, I just don't know how I'm going to approach this. And he said, son, when you're dealing with difficult people, often in that conflict and conversation that you enter, they're using words and choosing language that escalates the conflict and the situation. It creates more tension. And when you walk into that conversation trying to bring resolution, you need to choose differently because the words that you choose could throw gasoline on that fire or they can douse it with water. So choose your words carefully and choose language, use language that de-escalates the conversation and the emotion and the conflict. It's wise advice, isn't it, from my dad? And I think of him often on Father's Day and how his wisdom offered our family tools and ways that would help us in difficult things that we all faced. We've all had to navigate these kinds of conflict, relational conflict with our kids, sometimes with other parts of our family. We've all had to deal with difficult people. Do you remember the last time that you had to figure out the best words for a bad situation? Maybe you were dealing with a friend who was taking advantage of your generosity or simply walking all over you with you because you are a very kind and generous person. Or maybe you were dealing with a bully or had to wrestle with, with yourself or someone else who was overcome with pride, greed, jealousy, impatience. Maybe, maybe all of those things you've had to deal with and if you've ever had to walk through these kinds of situations, make difficult decisions, or survive a problem, there's a book in the Bible that you should spend time with regularly. And it's a book we're going to be studying together for over the next month. It's the book of Proverbs. And it's something you will definitely want to read on a regular basis. Proverbs is a book all about wisdom. And this Wisdom, that wisdom is a word that can help us in a variety of ways. It can help us to think better and live better. And it's what we'll be studying together for a number of weeks. So we'll see in this series that Proverbs are called Proverbs. There are hundreds of these short, quick sayings that offer us wisdom about facing life's challenges, about making difficult choices. And so I want to dig into this book right now together. Uh, as we, and start looking right at the beginning, the first seven verses of this text that, that set up everything for us perfectly. Look at Proverbs chapter one, verse one here on the screen. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. The one thing I love about the way this book sets everything up right from the beginning is it, is it grounds us in the context of where this information came from right out of the chute. The opening line confirms what historical books of the Bible already have told us. These are the words and wisdom of Solomon. Solomon is the son of David. That's right, the David who fought Goliath, the king of Israel. 
All right, so it gives us the setting. And if you ever want to learn and read more about Solomon, the source of this wisdom that we're gonna be spending time in, time in over the next month, you can read the book of First Kings in your Bible. It records a ton of information about Solomon's rule and governance of Israel. But when Solomon first started, and if you do decide to read First Kings, it's an interesting account. We're gonna look at it briefly this morning because what I want you to see is that when Solomon got started after his dad died, he was actually anxious, extremely intimidated by the thought of taking over, governing Israel and ruling this nation after his dad did so, so successfully. We're gonna look at this together quickly because see, after the death of his father, he went and did exactly what his father asked upon his death. He asked Solomon, he said, look, I want you to go to a variety of different locations around our kingdom and I want you to worship God and perform these rituals. And as Solomon does so after his father's death, God appears to Solomon in a vision and says this. Look at 1 Kings with me up here on the screen. He says, Solomon, ask for whatever you want. This is God talking to Solomon in this vision. Ask for whatever you want me to give you. What do you want? What do you want? Can you imagine? It's like a genie in a bottle. Can you imagine God asking you, hey, you know what? Think about what you want, and I'll give it to you. What do you want? What would you ask for? Are you having financial problems? You'd ask, would you ask for money? Would you ask for authority and power? Maybe you want more attention and you'd, you'd, you'd ask for a talent or a skill that you don't currently have. What would you ask for? Here's the interesting thing with Solomon. He doesn't ask for any of those things. Look at what Solomon says to God to answer this question. He, Solomon answers, God, you have shown great kindness to your servant. He's talking about himself. I'm your servant, he says. My father, David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. He's describing his dad. You have continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. He's referring to himself. He's now taking over the rulership of Israel. Now, Lord God, you've made your servant king in place of my father, David, but I am only a child and I don't know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people too numerous to number. Now, remember what I told you a minute ago about this? About Solomon feeling anxious? He felt inadequate to take over for his dad. Do you see that coming out in what he's saying and how he's responding to this question God asked him? What do you want? But it doesn't end with him describing his own insecurities. Look at what he follows this up with in the specific request. He says, so give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong for who is able to govern this great nation of yours. And God is so impressed with Solomon's request that he gives him so much more than what he asked for. He gave him wealth, he gave him power, he gave him success in addition to giving him the wisdom. But that's not what Solomon was remembered for. He wasn't remembered for his great wealth or power or success. Solomon has been consistently remembered for his wisdom. Look at how God blesses him with this wisdom later in chapter four. It says, God gave Solomon wisdom and great insight, a breadth of understanding as measureless as the sand on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom was so great that it was greater than any of the wisdom all to the east or to the people to his west in Egypt. It didn't matter if you were standing in Israel, what direction you looked, Solomon's wisdom was greater than any wisdom in that direction. But this record of sayings that we're gonna look at over the next number of weeks as we study together. It, had a, it has a specific purpose. It's not just about the source and where it came from and how we have it today. 
It has a very specific purpose. And if you have your Bible handy, I want you to follow along with me as we look at the first seven verses of this text in Proverbs and discover its purpose and how we can use this wisdom. And so I want you to see some of the word choices that were made, the language that was used to describe it. And so if you were following along in your Bible, great. If you don't have your Bible, you can open up our church app, hit the Bible button, and follow along with me. Again, uh, verse 1 in Proverbs. Let's go to that verse on the screen here. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. What, are they, what is it for? These wis this wisdom is used for gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight. It's also here for receiving instruction on prudent behavior and doing what is right and just and fair. This is not just about the knowledge you acquire from reading this information, it's what you do with it. It's about absorbing it and taking action on it. That is a dense couple of verses. Think about, it, about the related terms in this text, in these first seven verses. The, worst, the verses that we just read, words like wisdom, instruction, insight, if you're looking in the app or in your physical Bible and you scan the verses that go beyond those first verses that we just read here, if you look at your Bible, you'll see verse, words like this that proceed after words like prudence. Knowledge is repeated again. Discretion, guidance, wisdom, instruction are repeated again as you look forward into these verses. And, and it would be interesting and helpful to look at all of these words in the original language. When you are studying scripture, it's important to go to the original language the text is written in so that you can understand fully what the author is trying to communicate, but we only have time to look at a couple this morning. The first word we're gonna look at is the word wisdom itself. Why focus on this word? It is the Hebrew word chokmah. Well, it's because this word appears in the book of Proverbs 118 times as a key word. It's overwhelmingly the theme of this text. But when you're looking at a word and studying it in order to understand what an author is saying, it's important to you to look at the way that this word is used in other places in scripture. And then if you really wanna get a full understanding of how it was used in the culture, not just in a biblical sense, you should look at sources outside of the Bible that were written in the same time period to get a full understanding of how this word was used in their culture. And then you can begin to understand what the author is trying to communicate. Well, in the sake of Solomon and this text that's recorded, the word hokma is not just about wisdom as you, as you and I know it. It was also used to describe a skill set, a skill set of someone like an artisan, someone who would work with, let's say, fine metal, or a carpenter who would make things out of wood, or a mason or even a warrior and their skills that they would use in battle. And when we go back to verse three, and we see that, that this is about doing what is right and just and fair, and how that's communicated, you can begin to understand how, all right, he's not just talking about wisdom as, as you and I think about it every day, he's talking about a moral, skill set. Wisdom is not just a tool, it's a moral skill that you can apply in your everyday life. Look again at verse 3. For receiving instruction, these, these wisdom sayings are for receiving instruction in prudent behavior, doing what is just, right, and fair. He's talking about subject matter as it relates to our everyday behaviors. And pursuing wisdom in, in our everyday life is all about thinking better, and then doing something with our thought and living better every day. Do you see how that applies? Let me give you a couple examples to, to explain further what I'm talking about. Let, think about the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments provide us with a set of instructions that are very clear and easy to comprehend, to understand the words, right? 
Look at one of these commandments, Exodus 20, 14. You should not commit adultery. Simple statement, simple instruction, easy to understand. Don't cheat on your spouse. But it's wisdom that helps us implement the moral skillfulness to live that out to avoid situations that could lead to a tempting result so that we can focus on our spouses instead. Again, another example, right within the Ten Commandments. Here's an extreme one. Don't murder. Don't kill someone else without reason, without you know, Don't murder, easy to understand, right? But it's wisdom, again, that helps us navigate the emotions, those extreme circumstances that could even have anyone considering to behave in this extreme way, to help us manage the anger that we feel. It's wisdom. Now, whether that wisdom comes through stories or parables or proverbs, it is a helpful tool that can be implemented as a moral skill set. The knowledge of the commandment doesn't help you live the commandment. You just understand it. It's wisdom and the management of the choices we face every day that helps us live it out. Someone once said, and I don't know where it came from, they said this, knowledge is knowing what you can do. Wisdom is knowing when not to do it. And so if these wisdom sayings are for us to provide instruction to us, what people groups is this, is this being recorded for? Was it originally just because if you read the text, if you read through the entire book of Proverbs, let's say this week, you're going to see language that Solomon is recording this for his son. He wants to impart this knowledge to his child. So he is left with something to help him rule and govern and to not feel the same way he felt. But it's so much more than that, and you can see that right in the beginning of these next couple of verses. Let's look at the next two verses, four and five. This, this knowledge is for gaining prudence, for who? To those who are simple. Knowledge and discerning to the young. And then it's for more than that. Let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance. So verse four clearly states that this is written for the young and for the simple. People who are, are simply ignorant because they don't have the life experience to help them navigate every decision that they're about to face. This wisdom can give them something to apply to their moral skill set to navigate those difficult challenges, challenges as a young man or woman. It makes me think about uh, this TV show that was on in the late 90s, America's Dumbest Criminals. Have you ever seen this show? I, I encountered with someone who I think could have been on this show, very quite easily could have been on this show. As some of you may not know this, but I, I pastored a church up in Minnesota for a number of years. And while up there, man, Minnesota, it is cold, cold. It is so cold that when you are, if you worked downtown, they had tunnels that connected the buildings to one another so that you never had to step outside. I never went to a city that had heated bus stops for the people waiting for the bus outside. That's how cold, it got so cold that kids, when school was canceled, it wasn't canceled because of snow, it was canceled because a kid couldn't stand at a bus stop if it was colder than 10 below zero. That's how cold it got there. Sometimes we'd go out, it'd be 30 below with the wind chill. And man, so when you, I would leave my car and walk into the church office, I could not wait to get into the, I just, it felt so good. You know when you're outside in the cold and you open the door and you feel that blast of heat hit you? It's almost like when you're out in the hot sun in the summer, like it's warming up right now and that air conditioning feels great. Well, the heat feels just as great when you're out in the cold and I open the church office and I walk inside, I'm waiting for that blast of heat to hit me and it doesn't hit me. And I open my eyes and I'm like, oh, the heat is out? Are you kidding me? And I flip on the light. The heat was not out. There's glass everywhere across the lobby. And then I look over, we had a soda machine in our lobby of the church. 
I look over and the soda machine looks like it was attacked by a grizzly. And I'm thinking, what the heck is going on in here? We've been, and I realize it, we've been, someone was trying to break into the soda machine and get the money. And there are doors that are opened and busted. I'm wondering, what the heck is going on? And so, I'm thinking, what? So we call the police right away. And come, so come to find out, the police come and do their investigation. A window has been busted in. And that's why there was glass all over the place. And there was also glass and plastic shattered everywhere because someone had ripped the arm and the blade off of a paper cutter and was trying to hack their way in and use it as a pry bar into the soda machine to access the money in the machine. And so the police did their report and I didn't think we were gonna hear anything of this, what was gonna happen next. And so a couple days go by, the police call back. And they say, we've got your guy. We just wanted you to know, you don't have to do anything. I just wanted you to know we got your guy. I'm like, how did you get this guy? Like, how was there any evidence to get this guy? Well. We got a solid footprint in the snow with a mold when they stepped in through the window. And then we found the evidence right on him because he had one of your laptops. It was, had the church's name in it. And we also found the blade that he ripped off of the cutting board, the paper cutter. He kept everything with him. I could not believe that he kept everything with him. And here's the thing about it. If he had come to the church and told us that he was struggling with something, we would have helped him. We would have helped him if we didn't have the resource specifically that he needed to navigate his problem. We would have sent it, we would have connected him with someone who could have helped him if we couldn't. But he was just interested in scoring his next thing to feed an addiction. He could have benefited from some of the wisdom that we're gonna look at over the next few weeks. But this wisdom is not just for the simple. He also says, let the wise listen. The wise should listen to this as well. And this is why this is so important. Because I, just from my own personal experience, yes, I still learn from Proverbs. As, as I've matured spiritually and matured in age, when I read this book over and over and over again, I learn new things based upon the life experience I've had and the new knowledge that I've gained. It's not just about how much wisdom you think you have. This is for everyone. But I also want us to know this, notice the next two verses as to where wisdom should begin as it relates to our lives as individuals. Look at these next couple of verses. It's also for understanding, proverbs and practices, the sayings and riddles of the wise. And then this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. What, what does that mean? Well, this is the second Hebrew word we're going to look at today. It's the word resit. Resit. Which means the start. Literally, it means not just the beginning, but the starting point in which you move forward. Not a general beginning, a very specific start. And so when you explore this thought further, you can, you can see how this is connected to spiritual things. Because when you're considering the fear of the Lord being the place that spiritual knowledge starts, you've got to start somewhere as it's connected to the divine if you're going to grow spiritually, right? And so to grow in spiritual things, you need to start with the fear, the awe, the reverence, and the respect that you should have for God. Because if you don't start there, well, then you automatically, automatically default to the end of verse 7. If you can't start with the fear, awe, and reverence of God and his wisdom and how it should apply to your life, then you, you are a fool that just simply despises wisdom and instruction. It's pretty straightforward. Instead of despising wisdom, we should pursue it. 
We should go after it with everything in our being. The responsibility is on you and I to pursue wisdom. It's not to wait for it to be handed to us. It is for us to go after it. The pursuit of wisdom needs to be a priority in our lives. I was talking to our Connections pastor about this this week, Terry. And I asked her, I said, you know, what, what do you think of when you are thinking of Proverbs? What, what verses come to mind for you? And she listed a number of them. But the one that she listed that stuck with me throughout this week as I was preparing was chapter four of Proverbs. It, says, it simply says, just get wisdom. Get it. Get wisdom, get understanding. And don't forget my instruction. Don't forget my words or turn away from them. Go and get wisdom. The pursuit of wisdom needs to be a priority. And let's just shift gears here for a second, come at this from a different angle. What is it in your life that you are pursuing right now? The last couple of months, just think about the last few months of your life every day what are you going after? Maybe this whole year and a half has messed up your career and you're just pursuing a job. Maybe you're pursuing a promotion. Maybe you've been having health challenges and you've been seeking medical advice for healing and moving forward with your life. Maybe you've been going after a relationship with a specific someone. Maybe you just need to resolve some issues that you have in your family. What have you been going after? For so many of us, when the, the sum of our lives is the pursuit of wealth. Because in Western culture, more money equals more stuff. More money equals easier retirement. More money equals more influence. More money, we matter more to the people around us. Whatever it is that you've been pursuing, Solomon's advice would be different. Stop investing all of your energy in the pursuit of, and you fill the blank. And he would say this, look at Proverbs 8, 10, and 11, because this is the overarching idea that's going to tie everything we look at over the next months together into a bow, into a nice gift. He says this, choose. That word is so important, friends. It's up to you. It's up to you. Choose my instruction. Choose God's wisdom instead of silver. Knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is more precious than rubies and nothing. Do you see that word? Nothing you desire. Nothing can compare with her. Nothing compares with God's wisdom. What this inspired text is telling us is that, is that wisdom is gonna serve you so much better than whatever it is that you've been going after the last few months. Even people that are separated from spiritual things and consumed with secular thought know how important wisdom is. Albert Einstein said, wisdom is not a product of schooling. It's not something you can learn in a book. But the lifelong attempt to acquire it. So this is what I want us to do together. The next couple of months, it's actually six weeks or so, we're going to be looking at Proverbs together and studying various points of advice that Solomon has acquired to share. I want us to together pursue wisdom. 
pursue what is contained in this text and go after it. I want you to read a chapter every day. There's 31 chapters in Proverbs. You could easily finish it before the series is over. Read a chapter a day. I, to make this easy, I went to the longest chapter in Proverbs this week and I read through it slowly at my desk. It took me four minutes. I read slowly. Four minutes. I think all of us can give up four minutes a day to pursue some wisdom. So let's do that together as we enter into this series and see how all of us may think better and live better. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much. I thank you so much for this wisdom that you imparted to Solomon and for how we may benefit it from it still today because it's it's not just something you gave him that he intended to pass on to his son. God, it's, it's very clear that you intended this to be for all of us, for all of us who will lack experience and knowledge in life, and for those of us who are already wise. God, we are so grateful for the practical things we are going to learn together over the next number of weeks. God, may we all, this week, starting today, think better and live better. In Jesus' name, amen.